Today I'm going to be busting out Tauros and Pokemon Yellow, and this is a great time to talk about something that comes up often in the comments, but I've never really talked about, and it's competitive compared directly to a speedrun. Now in the scope of RBYOU, Tauros is an S tier Pokemon, but so are things like Executor, and you kind of seen how that run went. And if you just take like a preliminary first little glance at Tauros, you'll notice that it has 100 attack, 110 speed, and it's a normal top, so it gets stabbed, body slam, and that's already kind of like the recipe just to cruise through the game looks pretty solid and then when you look at this little TM list here it also has things in common with other normal tops like really good coverage Ice Beam, Blizzard, Thunderbolt, Earthquake some of the best moves in the game so everything's looking really good right now but the first little red flag is the level up learn set so the main focus you can look at it all if you want but I just want you to focus at the very top you only get tackle until level 21 and it goes without saying that tackle is not going to blow the doors off of a solo run and you have to use it for a very long time but this gets even worse when you consider that it's just Brock's gonna hard wall us so we have to level up a lot and that goes directly into that second red flag Tauros is another one of those Pokemon that's just tossed into that slow leveling group and we already know how the equation goes you got a bad level up learn set you don't have moves for Brock but you also need to get a ton of levels it's gonna be really slow and it's gonna put you on the back foot starting out and you're gonna have a really slow time but that is pretty much the biggest problem with Tauros there's a little bit little minor things in there so the strat here is to get to pewter as fast as possible. So do the one mandatory bug catcher, go straight there, and it's time for some light years blackout grinding. Now you're pretty much guaranteed one blackout. And oftentimes I'll reset a run if I don't get a result I want, especially if it's this early in the game. But I really wanted to get two blackouts here. It's kind of hard to do. I don't even know if it's possible to get a third blackout. But once you hit level eight, you start to do too much damage. Eventually we're gonna get the two blackouts and I'm gonna beat the trainer. But then you really only have one choice left to do. You have to go beat up some wild caterpies. So I picked up an escape rope earlier and I guess I'm gonna use this time to tell you that sometimes when I do runs, I have everything planned out and I just do stuff different and I don't realize it till later. And this is gonna be one such moment. So I have a very specific number and in all of my other iterations, I had a very, very precise experience range. I would grind, I'd go back and heal, then I would come back, fight all the trainers, and then escape rope out at the end. So I decided on the fly here that I'm gonna do everything at once because it'll be faster and I'll save a couple of minutes. And it works out pretty good. You you do get to struggle strats at the end, but you have to buy so many potions when you black out anyway. It wasn't really a problem, but there's one little key thing that I want you to notice. When I escape rope out, I am 181 experience away from hitting 13. Now where I got my wires crossed here, I won't get into it much. I'm supposed to be level 13 now, and just in the course of playing this game, I just forgot. So I'm going into Brock at level 12. If I would have lost here, I probably would have realized it, but let's talk about the rock solid Pokemon trainer. There's not really much to say about this battle. Level 15 would be like the most comfortable that you could be, but I'm not about comfort. I'm about beating the game as fast as you can. And level 13 is really good. But remember, I'm level 12 for some reason because I forgot. And I guess like the whole crux of this battle, what everything comes down to is that you just spam tackle and hope that you win. Now here, it's kind of like a little stroke of genius. And I do end up saving time. I get through on my first try. If I would have failed here, I probably would have eventually noticed that I was only level 12 and I would have just restarted the run but it works out here. I don't get as many crits as I would like on the Geodude, but I start to get really crit heavy towards the end of the Onyx, and that's really good. And getting by here with no resets, it's about as good as you could really hope for because this is one of those runs where I was probably gonna accept a couple of resets on Brock just to get a video out. And if you think about it, you might say, hey, you're past Brock, so that's like your hardest challenge. Now you can just start to cruise through the game. But I want you to remember one simple fact. We are stuck with only tackle until level 21. So it's not great, but I still keep things to the bare minimum. In Mount Moon, I just fought the optional super nerd, and I do have to pick up the rare candy because it's very, very important for Tauros, and everything's pretty standard outside of that. Picking up in Cerulean, the first thing I do before I even heal is I go straight to Misty's gym, and the idea here is that I'm gonna battle her two extra trainers, and I want you to notice here, this is where my first little inkling came in that I did something wrong early and this goes straight back to only being level 12 going into Brock is that I didn't level up to 18 at the end of the Goldeen trainer 18 was very important for rival number 
number two, it just made things a little bit better, the extra damage rounding threshold. And at this point, I knew something was up. I didn't really want to restart the run yet, but there is like some specific points that I wanted to reach experience and use candies later, and I was just going to keep an eye on it. And if I remember, I'll let you guys know, but let's look at rival number two. I would love to give some in-depth analysis, and this is pretty much going to be the last major fight we cover, but all I can say is that I just used Tackle. I hope I don't get growled, but I do, and then when you make it to the Sand Shrew eventually, you hope you don't get Sand Attacked, but once again, I do, and I can't blame all of this on not being level 18 up front, because ultimately it didn't really matter, but Tauros just kind of fights his way through this battle. I do get kind of low, but that's all I can do. I just use Tackle, I eventually make it through, no resets, everything's good, wasn't great, wasn't fast, but I won, and that's really all I cared about. And now it's time for Nugget Bridge, and I love talking about the clusters, but the fact of the matter is that Tauros is just not really equipped for this. Instead, I would like to skip ahead and show you how scary it can be if you never go back and heal, because I'm in struggle strats, and I'm going to go into this battle right here at 24 HP. I take out the Rattata with struggle. Good thing you didn't use quick attack, because you'll see why. I go down to just 7 HP, and that gives me just enough experience to learn Stomp. I can take out the Ekans, and I can finally get through the rest of this route, but you can see already that Tauros is struggling just a little bit and it makes for some pretty good content when you cut things this close but this is all 100% because I didn't get that extra experience in Viridian Forest but now we can take a look at Misty. I guess at level 18 you had like a shot here with tackle but it didn't really feel good. Bubble Beam does heavy damage. There's no guarantee Misty will go for it but the whole the TLDR of this fight is you, I have stomp now. I can use Stomp. It's pretty easy. I do get beat up just a little bit, but Stomp makes this a pretty easy battle. And finally, the huge pains of the run are about to come to an end. Now let's get down to the SSN and finally we get Body Slam. I don't want to be too hyperbolic, but this is pretty much run saving and allows Tauros to be a pretty formidable Pokemon. And if you don't believe me, we can just quickly go through the next couple of major battles here. Pretty much a night and day difference when it comes to Rival 3. One shots on everything with Body Slam and I could just lump Surge into the mix here. Pretty much the only way Surge can beat you is if maybe if he gets like a Thunderbolt into Paralysis into you skipping your turn and then using a second Thunderbolt or something like that. You really, it's hard to lose those battles what I'm trying to say. We get through this one pretty quick and then we get access to Thunderbolt. And now we're starting to pick up some of these moves. Tauros is starting to feel a little bit better. But first, I would like to talk about split data. So today you can see it says 91, 91 overall split. I think it's Dodrio split, doesn't matter. What I want you to notice now is that we're in the hole. Obviously we didn't have a great Brock split and we had to do a lot of extra grinding. And what that means is that after Lieutenant Surge, we're about eight and a half minutes out of the hole. The main takeaway from me playing Toro so much is that it's, it's badness, I guess, if you want to say, is front loaded. Everything that's bad about this Pokemon is front loaded. And hopefully we can start to maybe chip away at some of this stuff, but we'll see how it goes after we're done with the gems. But here's how it looks. Not too great. About kind of what you expect at this point. And normally we would skip over Rock Tunnel, but we do have to talk about the Boomer Hiker. I only have normal moves. They're resisted. He's immune to Thunderbolt, so I really don't have anything for him. And what's surprising is that like every once in a while, you'll see these little glimpses from Tauros, because right here, you're gonna see, even with just Body Slam, I'm going to just easily take him out. I get pretty fortunate, I'm not gonna lie. I get, I think, three total crits in this battle. He never goes for self-destruct, so I don't really have to worry about it. This is another point, kind of like Brock, where if I had a reset here, I would just keep the run going because it's kind of expected to get some bad luck, you know, every now and then. But I did want to highlight this fight because it wasn't great, even though Tauros makes it look pretty easy right here. Now we can skip over to Celadon, and today I have to buy immediately, so I go shop before I do anything else. The main reason is that I need Ice Beam, so I pick it up and I learn it immediately. And then the only other thing is that I scrounge together just enough money to pick up three proteins. I guess you know it's kind of like not a great run when I have to buy vitamins at all, but it really does help Tauros, uh, specifically in one fight. We'll talk about it when we get there, but that's all I do here. And now let's clean up a few small sections of the game. 
first up is the rocket hideout and since I've already been to the shop I'm not gonna pick up high money items the only thing I would like to just quickly touch on is that I did test double edge I thought it might help me get through a couple of fights maybe under leveled and it just turned out to not really be the case so it's kind of like straight to the point here and the main reason that we had to go ahead and get ice beam is because Giovanni is actually pretty tough without it and we just have the luxury you already know when you have ice water grass moves against Giovanni it makes it a lot easier so I'm able to mow him down and it would have been really nice to be able to hold off on things and maybe pick up just a few more vitamins here and there but I made it work and at this point after having the start that Tauros had I just wanted to be as efficient and as fast as possible as I could through the rest of the game. Now let's take it over to Pokemon Tower. I'm going to skip over the rival and I just want to talk about one thing really. Pretty common topic, but Tauros doesn't really have a good answer for the Gastlys. I have had runs just be derailed here. There's even one point where I thought if maybe I should level up a little bit more or maybe grind some extra trainers, but you can see that you can get a pretty high percent two shot range. And as long as you don't get confused and start hitting yourself, things are fine. I end up kind of YOLO in it here. I'm a little bit low already, but it works out. I did want to talk about it because to me, it was kind of like one of those parts to where I was like should I work on this or was the Brock split already bad enough to where I just got to cut all the corners that I can now we get into what I would say is the runs only little extra training spree that's pretty heavy I'm gonna fight all the bikers here I've talked about these a lot in videos I'm gonna have like little steel frames for all of them just so you know there's seven total there is an eighth biker that has Voltorbs but I really don't like that fight too much and it's gonna get me some really really crucial levels and I guess while we're showing all this stuff I'll just talk about like some more thoughts on Tauros and the slow leveling group really hurts this Pokemon when you make it to about your early 30s Every option that's available to you is pretty tough to take on. That's including like Erica, you look at Sylph Cove, Koga, Sabrina. They're all really tough without levels. But if you use your rare candies hastily and just don't really think about it, you're really going to miss those levels at the end of the game too. So there's some sort of balance. And for me, I think this is like the best mid game training spot. So I just take them all out and I get some, like I said, very much needed levels. And since I'm here, I'm already going to swing down to the Safari Zone. And the only thing here that I do is I do pick up the protein. I love the extra proteins for this run, so I picked that up. And now we can backtrack and we can finally take on Erica. Now this fight's not too great. Tangela with this little weak spaghetti arms, you already know how I feel about it. It's not too bad. Hitting level 35 after it, I'm pretty sure on the old route, if I were to hit 13 for Brock, I would already be 35, but it doesn't really matter in this case. I digress. But you have Ice Beam, and everything's pretty much a two shot. I think you have a pretty decent range on Weeping Bell, but I don't hit it here. The worst case scenario, as always, is you get put to sleep, and I do get paralyzed here. This ends up being really, really close, and this fight's just not good, I guess is what I'll say but compared to like every other alternative that you can take on at this point this is easily the best option and the fact that it was so close should sort of like cue you in on how it's kind of like a struggle to play Tauros just a little bit but we get the win here fourth badge down let's go get some more upgrades in Silphco, I have one singular goal is to make it to that 10th floor and make it to Earthquake as fast as humanly possible. That really rounds out the set. Like if you have Thunderbolt, Ice Beam, Earthquake, what more could you really want? And basically once you make it to this stage in the run, the only thing you could really ask for is that you somehow magically wasn't in the slow leveling group, but you can't really do anything about that. Outside of that 10th floor visit, there's really only one little wrinkle here. I pick up one scientist, goes down really easy with Earthquake, and that means we can jump straight into Rock Rival number five. I'm gonna go ahead and say it that this is the last fight that you could do without too much hassle still in your 30s it's the last place you have left to go and what you're gonna notice as the fight plays out is that you can't really one-shot things and that's like a theme for Tauros ultimately keep this in mind later when we make it to the elite four you're gonna wonder hey why are you such a high level or maybe could you have done this run at like five lower levels the answer is no because Tauros for some reason it always seems like he's just not enough you always 
always need just a couple of extra levels. And much like Erica, we're just getting two shots here and we're just kind of hoping. Starts out really good with a freeze. We're just two shotting here and there. The one singular mistake I made, human error, is I accidentally used Thunderbolt against the Flareon. But at the end of the day, it doesn't cost us. But if you were to come here without doing that extra cycling road training, this one's pretty difficult. And it wasn't really too bad if you're past level 35. So we got it done. After that, I'm immediately gonna go to Sabrina. Not really much to say here. Weak Pokemon. Tauros is just incredibly fast, so I already outspeed everything. And by everything, I mean just the Abra, I guess. But if you outspeed the Abra, you're usually pretty good. Body Slam strong enough to not really matter. Alakazam does hit me really, really hard. Made me a little bit scared, not gonna lie, but I do get it done. Another quick badge is down, and I'll take that any day of the week. Now we're down in Fuchsia, and the only thing to say here is that I'm going to fight another optional trainer. The first tamer here is going to give me just enough experience that when I defeat the second mandatory juggler, I'll hit 41. And from that point, I'm going to use four rare candies, get myself up to level 45, and that's going to put me in a way, way better position than trying Koga at anything before this. So let's see how that goes. This is where the proteins come in handy because without them, I would say that you maybe have like a 60% chance to one shot the first Venonat and it just keeps going down after that. But if you use five proteins like I have in this run so far, that chance on the first Venonat pretty much goes up to about 90%. Then you have like a 60 something percent on the second one. And you can see here that I get those two ranges and I knock it out. And while I'm not gonna be able to knock out the third Venonat in one hit, it basically means that even if I get top Toxic put on me like you're gonna see here, it just doesn't really have enough time to tick to really mean anything. And unless Venomoth starts using double team and you start missing like three or four turns, it's not that bad of a battle. 45 felt really solid with this one. But just a pretty important note, this was the reason for those proteins. Normally I don't even like to buy or pick up vitamins, but it definitely made this fight feel a lot better. Now it's time for that brisk swim down to Cinnabar. You already know we can kind of see the end in sight just a little bit. And the only thing that we need to cover is that I picked up Blizzard down here for a very, very important moment in the run later. Comment down below if you can guess what Blizzard's actually for. But other than that, brother, we just contemplate on if TM28 is actually Tombstoner, brother, or not. Blaine is up next, and I just use Earthquake. I don't really know what other strategy you guys would want me to do, but I get pretty fortunate here. I actually crit on all three Pokemon. It's unfortunate that the Arcanine can survive one, but I'm at full health pretty much, so I can just tank whatever he does to me. Maybe a Fire Blast crit would kill me. I don't know. I don't really want to look anyway. But this was not too bad. In practice, I did lose this a couple of times, but you can always lose against Yellow Version Blaine if you get unlucky. But that's going to give us seven gym badges down. Now we got Giovanni, and this is not a great fight. There's a few things that you would love to have happen, and there's a couple of things that you don't want to have happen. But up first, Doug Trio, who cares about this little sausage trio? Slam it, get it out of here, who cares? Persian cannot use Screech on you. If it uses Screech, you're gonna take too much damage. The fight's pretty much over. If it crits, it makes the fight harder, so you hope it doesn't really do anything. I'll take a three turn Fury Swap any day of the week here. So when you get to the Nidos, they know double kick. It really hurts. So what you really want to happen is you want to maybe get a freeze proc on the ice beam or you want to get a patented guard spec by Silfco and it sucks to kind of rely on these strategies but I really didn't want to level up or use any candies at this point and just like other moments in the run so far I was willing to take a reset if need be but if you give Giovanni enough chances to use a guard spec by god he's gonna use it you already know he's gonna use it he does end up using it on the Nido Queen which is probably the spot you would rather him not use use it because Nidoking's King's more attack weighted and Rhydon can do a ton of damage but at least he used it that's what we wanted so at the end of the day we're going into Rhydon at decent health if it uses Earthquake at this range you're probably dead but what he ends up doing is going for Rock Slide it does a ton of damage but we're still living got 19 HP left and I take the final badge 
Jumping straight into Rival 6, you're gonna notice something. I'm half health, I didn't heal, so why is that? Well, number one, I think yellow version Rival 6 is a lot easier than red and blue just because the challenges before this are so hard. Even if you just look at two of them, like Giovanni and Blaine, they're just so much better than this fight in my opinion, so I'm gonna win easy. But oftentimes, like you've seen earlier with the Brock fiasco where I didn't have enough experience, when I make some mistakes, I start to cut corners and I start to see if I can really push things later to make up time and this is one of those moments. I know you guys can see like split pace and stuff like that when we talk about it in the video but remember when I'm playing these runs I'm kind of constantly looking at them and I'm just trying to find little ways to make up time but I do make it through this this isn't that bad but a win here does mean we only have just a little bit more to go. So in Victory Road, I'm gonna battle the only two trainers on the first floor here, two cool trainers. It's gonna give me just enough experience. I'm gonna hit level 50. I have seven rare candies, so I'm gonna use them all. I'm gonna get to level 57. And this is kind of like a high level for a slow leveling group Pokemon, especially when we got the stats and the move pool that we have, but it's really, really necessary. And getting to this level was a lot of the reason for the earlier grinding and holding off on candies and things of that nature. But we are set it here at level 57. So now I can bring up split data and we can talk about it once again. And it's not great. Everything's a red split. You can see things started to get like worse and worse and worse, but there's a positive note here. I think this is Dodrio's time, which he got about a 90, almost a 91. Tauros is still chipping away at it. When we're going into the Elite Four, he's only about six and a half minutes behind, which means just from the Giovanni split to the Elite Four start split, I saved about five minutes. And if you consider the fact that Tauros doesn't have to set up any, I've already front loaded all my rare candies. Maybe we could close the gap. I don't know by how much, but we're just being realistic with Tauros here. I, I gave him a 90 overall to try to beat. Doesn't look like he's gonna do it, but I can only play the Pokemon to the best of my abilities. And this is as good as I could get Tauros. So let's just hop into the Elite Four and just see how it goes down. So a lot of strategy with Tauros is pretty basic since you can't set up, you're just a normal type Pokemon. But we have Thunderbolt, super effective against all but one of Lorelai's team members. So the plan here is just to spam Thunderbolt. Funnily enough, your attack is so much higher than your special that Body Slam does equal or more damage than Thunderbolt in most situations. But just for the sake of saving PP and all that kind of stuff, I'm just spamming Thunderbolt here. And what you really hope is that you don't get like an early growl or like an Aurora Beam attack drop because that would be a death sentence and what ultimately ends up happening is that I just slowly trudge my way through the spot two shot here two shot there every Pokemon that comes out gets a chance to hit me and they do I take some chip damage and I can one shot the Jinx just fine but that means when we make it to Lapras I'm at 86 health which isn't the worst thing in the world but it does have hydro pump and blizzard and I will say the thing about 70 base special it's good enough to survive attacks it's just not really good enough to use your special like for offense so Lapras is gonna use a blizzard it hits hard it takes me down all the way to 9 HP and I'll be honest with you guys I don't know if I was gonna get the two shot regularly here but I get the crit and Tauros pulls out a win so first try I'll take it next up is Bruno and we know how Bruno usually goes but we are a normal top so there's always that chance I'll say this up front, if Machamp uses submission and crits, it will knock us out pretty much every single time. But for the most part, we're prepared for this fight. I use Ice Beam on the Onyxes and the Hitmonchan just because Hitmonchan has such higher defense than it does special. I end up critting, and overall, I make this thing look pretty easy. I'm getting one shots left and right, and what it always comes down to is will Machamp go for that one little kill shot? That one little 10% chance, even less than 10%, will it do it? And the answer is no because I just crit again in the battle and we're already down. Now, if there was one Elite Four member that was easy, it's Agatha, because you have guaranteed one-shots on every single Pokemon but the Golbat. So that's the only point of contention here. Now, you could go ahead and learn Blizzard, but I don't want to. I don't want to have to go into my menu. I don't want to have to use anything. So I just want to do the fight as is, and it's really not that bad. What does it use here? Leech Life, so it doesn't even matter. For every little struggle point and things that have been a little bit difficult for this run, Agatha is not one one of them, Toros completely annihilates her, and we can move on to Lance. 
So for Lance, I did use Blizzard. And the only thing that can really happen here is you miss too many Blizzards, but you just gotta make sure you have one for the Dragonite. Now it's kind of sad because Ice Beam will not do the trick here. It reminds me a lot of Kangaskhan, but just not quite as bad. You would have to be level 60 at this exact point to make Ice Beam work for you on 100% ranges. I'm not gonna go back and check, but that might not even be true. But Blizzard does give you those one-shot ranges. The only thing it doesn't, we already seen Gyarados go down. I think that's like a 60%, which was good enough in my book. And then you got 100% on the dragons, and the Aerodactyl doesn't have a guaranteed one-shot, which you're gonna see him survive here. But I get the freeze proc. I don't miss my blizzards. And this one turns out pretty easy. And the key thing here going into this last battle is that I hit level 60. We'll talk about that more, but let's just get into that final battle. Alright, so level 60 means two pretty huge things for this fight. The first two Pokemon don't really matter. Blizzard's gonna one-shot, Body Slam's gonna one-shot the Alakazam. They never really did matter. But the first big thing that level 60 means is that you don't have quite the guaranteed two-shot range on Blizzard, but it's like 80-something percent, so it's good enough for me. And you really just hope that you hit your moves and you don't see Hypnosis. I guess that's pretty much the same every time you see Executor, but it doesn't happen here. I get the two-shot without critting. That's exactly what you want to see. The second thing that level 60 does is it makes Magneton have a really good range. It's 65% with the proteins to one shot it with Earthquake. If you're less than 60, the range is pretty bad and more likely than not, you're just going to get thunder waved and the fight's going to become a lot more difficult and slower than it needs to be. So level 60 was key here just to get that one shot range. And from that point, the fight's pretty much over. I don't, maybe you could get frozen by Cloyster, but I mean, how are you really going to plan around that? It doesn't really matter. And as long as you're not in quick attack range at the very end, Earthquake's going to take out Flareon. And that means that Tauros has done it. Tauros finishes with a final time of 2 hours, 36 minutes, and 18 seconds. And that's not too bad. It's We've already seen the split data. It is what it is. And for as much as... Let's go ahead and start bringing up this tier list here. For as much as this Pokemon felt bad, and I talked about Tackle, and you look back at like a... 25 minute Brock split and a 52 minute Misty split and all those things it felt bad but it really wasn't as bad as you think and remember you get a bonus in my gen 1 runs if you have zero resets it's only like 0.5 it doesn't matter too much but what I'm really ultimately trying to say is that despite everything Toro still made it on the first page here he's number 21 in some pretty good company I don't know how long he'll last probably not very long before you get moved to that third page and going into this one playing it a few times I was going to be absolutely shocked if this thing ever made A tier. After like my second run, I was thinking maybe this thing would be like below some of these other normal types like Snorlax or Kangaskhan or things of that nature. But I would say it outperformed my expectations. I think it feels very right on the money for it to be just out of A tier because this one's not intuitive. It doesn't feel good. Remember, I only played three runs, so I'm sure there's some more optimization you could do, but it's not, this Pokemon's not fun enough to warrant that for me. And if you made it this far in the video, I really do appreciate it. You are a real one. Special shout out to my channel members, my Patreons, and I'm hoping to get more Gen 1 content out. I know that sounds weird. I'm always putting it out, but like I need to get these vanilla runs so I can do a, you know, halfway through tier list or something like that. But I don't know. I don't really care. That's all I got for you. I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.